President Obama returned to Washington very early this morning, and the White House, while not pivoting away from the Tucson tragedy, did start to field questions today about whether there is anything in public policy that should change in response to this latest incident of American gun violence. We will have an opportunity to evaluate uh, ideas and proposals that may be brought forth as a result of the circumstances and the facts uh, around this case. Uh, the president, again, since I have been with him in 2004, has supported uh, the assault weapons ban, and we continue to do so. President will continue to support the assault weapons ban. You know, that position, a ban on semi-automatic assault weapons, that is w a position that, that, that Mr. Obama happens to share with his predecessor as president. During the 2000 presidential campaign, George W. Bush said he supported the assault weapons ban. It was a view that he continued to hold while he was president. Well, the president thought and said so at the time in 2000 that the assault weapon ban was a reasonable step supports the reauthorization of the current ban. George W. Bush ultimately failed on that campaign promise. The assault weapons ban was allowed to expire on his watch. But President George W. Bush, through his political career, did in fact support a number of gun control measures, things like banning the importation of large ammunition clips, banning guns within 300 yards of a school, raising the gun ownership age from 18 to 21, requiring instant background checks at gun shows, require, requiring trigger locks with, with handgun sales. George W. Bush supported all of these gun control policies. Which, of course, is why angry, enraged, paranoid NRA members picketed every one of George W. Bush's public appearances while he was president for all eight years. Oh, wait, that didn't happen. No, that didn't happen because George W. Bush's position on gun control was considered to be relatively mainstream and relatively non-controversial. Mr. Bush supported some what you might call common sense restrictions on what weapons Americans are allowed to have. And that's how the politics of the Second Amendment has worked. There is a broadly defined consensus, which includes both Barack Obama and George W. Bush and every other politician of either party who holds mainstream views on this subject. It's the consensus view that the Second Amendment protects the right of Americans to own firearms, but there are reasonable restrictions on what that means. In the wake of the Tucson shootings, with the realization that the only reason the alleged shooter was able to kill and wound so many people is because he could fire 30 bullets before he stopped to reload, because he had a high-capacity magazine that would not have been legal for him to buy had the ban on that not expired in 2004. In the wake of that realization, we have to decide as a country if we're going to keep to the mainstream, centrist, George W. Bush and Barack Obama included consensus on gun control that some restrictions are okay, or whether we are going to reject that long-held consensus. The common wisdom in Washington right now is that there can be no new policies concerning guns whatsoever. No restrictions on gun access are politically possible, no matter how great the need, no matter how big the problem that America has to confront about gun issues, no matter how great the national trauma, no matter how rational the restriction. I know that is the common wisdom, but the fact that it's common doesn't mean it's not radical. That's a radical assertion. That common wisdom that we cannot do anything about guns, that has never been true of gun politics in modern times. Saying all restrictions are off the table, that's a rejection of the centrist consensus we have had on this issue for generations. That is the view of the gun radicals. That's the view of the absolutists. Fellow patriots, we have a lot of domestic enemies of the Constitution, and they're right down the mall in the con Congress of the United States. And right down Independence Avenue in the White House of the United States, that belongs to us. It's not about my ability to hunt, which I love to do. It's not about the ability for me to protect my family and my property against criminals, which we have the right to do. But it's, about, it's all about us protecting ourselves from a tyrannical government of the United States. 
Second Amendment not about hunting or self-defense. It's about citizens having the ability to overthrow the tyrannical government of the United States. That was Congressman Paul Brown of Georgia speaking last April. E.J. Dion wrote about this at the Washington Post today. Uh, he found Republican Congressman Ron Paul making uh, roughly the same argument in print five years ago, quoting Mr. Paul, quote, the Second Amendment is not about hunting deer or keeping a pistol in your nightstand. It's not about protecting oneself against common criminals. It's about preventing tyranny. The founders knew that unarmed citizens would never be able to overthrow a tyrannical government as they did. The muskets they used against the British Army were the assault rifles of that time. Again, the argument here is that the Second Amendment exists so Americans can overthrow the government. Uh, that is a view. It is, it is a radical view of gun policy. We've had record gun sales, and when, Mer and, and when Americans are asked, why are you buying guns, they're buying it for civil unrest and to fight back against government tyranny. It's conservative talk radio host Alex Jones. We essentially have, have two choices about what kind of country we are on this issue of guns. Do we believe the Second Amendment requires the citizens of this country to be well armed enough to defeat the military of this country? Is it about the power to literally overthrow our government? If that's the case, then this week's common wisdom is right. No matter what the national trauma, there could be no regulation of the American people's firepower whatsoever. I mean, right now, it is essentially illegal for civilians to own machine guns, rocket-propelled grenade launchers, mortars, cannons, explosive time bombs, anti-tank guns, Molotov cocktails. I shouldn't say it's illegal. Technically, they are actually not outright banned, but we do restrict access to these things so greatly that these things that you see on the screen right here, these do not circulate among American citizens broadly. But if you are with the Alex Joneses and Ron Pauls and Paul Browns, if you are with the radicals on gun policy, then all of the laws that prohibit us from having these things need to change. In fact, all of the laws that prohibit us from having access to anything you can imagine in terms of weaponry need to change. Because in their view, to do right by the Constitution, you and I need to be able to defeat the US military in battle. We need to be able to overthrow the US government. So we need not only anti-tank guns and rocket-propelled grenade launchers and bombs. If the United States military is armed with depleted uranium munitions, if they're, if they're armed with nuclear weapons, in order to be able to compete with that, in order for you and me to go up against the tyrannical commander-in-chief of the US military and defeat him in battle, you and I should quite literally be able to obtain private nuclear weapons. This is not hyperbole. If you, if you believe the gun radicals' philosophy about guns, that gun rights are to protect our ability to overthrow the government, then we need to be able to destroy the U.S. military so we can overthrow that government. If he's commander-in-chief of the U.S. military, we need to be able to defeat him in battle. Is that what gun rights are for? If that is what gun rights are for, you and I need to be able to privately buy everything the military has and more. In fact, we would probably be advised in order to protect our gun rights to restrict what weapons the U.S. military is able to have so we can make sure we continue to have a tactical advantage. Forget the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union back in the 1980s. Under this view of gun rights, every day should be an arms race between you and me and the 82nd Airborne, if that's the way we're going to approach gun politics. Is that the philosophy with which we approach it? Or can we approach gun politics the way that we do in modern America, which is that we reject that radical position? I mean, we love and enjoy those folks, and we like playing tape of them on the television, but we don't move forward on their suggestions. It's all about us protecting ourselves from a tyrannical government of the United States. We can either accept that view of gun policy or instead accept the view that our Constitution allows law-abiding Americans to own weapons with some reasonable restrictions that allow us to be a modern industrialized democracy that is not a thunderdome. Joining us now is E.J. Dion, columnist for The Washington Post and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. E.J., thank you for writing that smart column today at The Washington Post. Oh, well, bless you, and thank you for taking this issue on and casting it that way. I think we should spend the whole segment surprising everyone and praising George W. Bush <laughs> for his very reasonable stand on gun control. <laughs> well, I mean, it, the thing that strikes me, though, is that for all of the differences that you can find among mainstream Republicans and mainstream Democrats, even on issues of gun control, there is a consensus that the, the country is capable of addressing problems when 
the solution touches on gun rights. That has been the consensus the entire time that I've been along and longer. We do accept some restrictions on gun rights. So why is the common wisdom now that nothing can be done in this issue? Um, you know, I think that the, we have had a detour on this ever since the assault weapons ban is passed uh, because a lot of Democrats got very, very, very timid about this after the 94 elections, after Al Gore couldn't just win the election outright without having the court intervene on Bush's side in 2000. And after they took the House in 06, because in, in, they're terribly worried about losing rural states uh, and losing rural congressional districts. In the meantime, most Republicans don't say they agree with Congressman Brown, but they've acted as if they do. The gun right, the, um, uh, the assault weapons ban was not extended under President Bush um, because the Congress was taking essentially uh, the NRA's position. And I do think what she said is really important because people have to understand what is the logic behind this position if it is based on this view that the purpose of the Second Amendment is to help us fight tyranny. And by the way, maybe the guys down the street now uh, are tyrants. Um, then you have to go all the way. If you're not going to go all the way, why can't we restrict uh, the big magazines? If you had sort of had a smaller magazine, it's very likely fewer people would have gotten shot in Tucson. Why can't we ban assault weapons? So, But I think it's going to take an enormous effort because there is just a huge political consensus that Republicans don't want to do it and Democrats are too timid to take it on. And they could have done it, by the way, in the last Congress when they controlled the Congress and Barack Obama was in the White House. And they didn't. But it's got to be done now. Is an event like this shock in Tucson a big enough shock to the political system that it could sort of shake loose the politics on this. I mean, the, I'm going to speak later on uh, on the interview tonight with um, the congresswoman from New York who has introduced uh, essentially the gun fix to reinstate that large capacity magazines um, ban. Is, has this event been enough to shake that, uh, to shake loose those politics? Uh, only if people stay on it for an extended period of time. I think that uh, the NRA and its allies have usually been able to wait out events uh, like this. They make public statements saying all we need to do is arm everybody. So you even have the proposals that Congress people should go around armed. I must say I wrote a column uh, using their rhetoric on how we're all safer uh, carrying guns, and it was a column called Arm the Senate. Let's take down all the barriers. If they really believe this, then they should want to walk around the Congress. At least some of these congressmen are living up to their word, but that's not going to solve the problem. Most people know that's not going to uh, solve the problem. But the, the NRA is in for a long game, and they have people who vote on this issue. They also, I can tell you, have people who write columnists a lot on this issue whenever they uh, cross them, which is fine with me. That's their First Amendment right. Um, but I don't think people who care passionately about gun control have ever made it a central voting issue uh, the way uh, anti-gun control voters have. There haven't been enough test cases where, say, a suburban Republican who voted against a sensible gun restriction actually faced a tough primary focused on these issues. Um, you're going to see some tests like that. People, this is going to be, I, it shouldn't be a long struggle, but I'm afraid it is. Last question for you, EJ, it's thought experiment. If the ban on fully automatic machine guns had an expiration date on it, like the assault weapons ban did, do you, th if that was expiring right now, could that ban be extended right now? I wonder, I, you know, I, 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 the first thought I had is the extension would be filibustered in the United States Senate. <laughs> but, you know, maybe President Obama has an interest finally in standing up on this. Maybe he should cast the issue, do you want to vote for the sensible George W. Bush uh, gun control bill, or do you stand with Congressman Brown? And I do think there, has to, there have to be some clear lines uh, drawn on this. Uh, and then people have to struggle. But, you know, sometimes people expect to lose and they lose and they lose and they finally win again. And maybe this terrible event will uh, open some minds again. E.J. Dion, columnist for The Washington Post, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution uh, and smart guy. Great to have you on the show as it's always. Great to EJ. be Thank with you. you. Thank you.